right, let's go ahead and find our seats. We'll carry on here with the rest of our service together. Good to be with you. Good to see you this morning. I want to welcome you on behalf of the whole staff. Um, I'm Jeremy. I have the, have the privilege of being the lead pastor here at uh, Radiant Church. And uh, behind me here is uh, pictures of our whole staff. And if you have any questions about anything at all, please track down one of these folks and we'll uh, do our best to help you out. Also, uh, I'd like to um, uh, call your attention to the back of each seat is a, what we call a next step card. And that is a way for us to get connected with you. If you want to be um, give us your info so we can send you updates on what's happening uh, week to week here at the church, that's one way we can do that. Also, it's a way for you to uh, help us help you take your next step. If wherever you are in your Christian journey, we all have a next step. Your next step might be uh, getting baptized, which we have a baptism coming up. Your next step might be uh, joining a small group. Your next step might be just saying, you know, I have some questions about Jesus, and I want to. I'm considering taking the step of salvation, but I, I'm I'm trying to figure this out. Sign up for a, a time for, uh, or let us know you would like some pastoral care in that area. We are here to help you take that next step. So let us know and uh, drop that in the one of the golden plates as they go around when the uh, uh, ushers uh, take the offering here. And also, on the uh, speaking of finances, we have available out on the welcome desk a uh, little sheet that is just a finance report for 2021, just to show you uh, how things uh, uh, turned out with the year, just uh, for... Uh, transparency. So if you have any questions about that, that you want to take a deeper dive and you want to know more, uh, you can see uh, Pastor Ryan because he, uh, he, he's the one who puts these together. I'm going to be a very little help to you in this area, uh, but he, he can be a great help. But uh, one thing about us, both Ryan and I and all the pastors, none of us know who gives what. We just know uh, at each week the grand total of what comes in and what goes out. But, um, but Ryan is here to help if you have any questions about that. Well, have the ushers come on up. We'll uh, bless the Lord with our giving. And as we say each week when we do this, lots of different ways to give, but whatever, however you do it, it's worship. This is a way to worship the Lord and to say, Lord, all of me belongs to all of you. And as we give of these tithes and of these offerings, that's what it is. So lots of different ways you can give. You can text to give. You can give online. You can give on the app. You can give in the plates. You can mail it in. Either way, do it with a cheerful heart. Amen. Lord, we thank you that uh, this time of giving would be uh, a time of worship, that hearts, that, that everyone who gives today would give with a cheerful heart, not under any kind of compulsion, but with joy, uh, delighting in you and, and making a declaration to you about how uh, you, as you poured out your generosity upon us, Lord, we want to also walk in that same generosity, uh, saying we give you our time, our talent, and our treasure. Now, Lord, I pray you'd bless each giver as they do so, and each gift would be that it would be used to advance your kingdom in this house, in this community, and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to let you know of something exciting we have coming up. We are Dun, 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 clear, really close to Easter. It's here before you know it. And one of the things that we've done for years is we don't just focus on Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday as a time of celebration, but we want to join in with the church calendar and prepare our hearts uh, in a variety of ways to anticipate Easter and so that we can prime the pump, so to speak, so that when we get to Easter, Easter doesn't sneak up on us, but we are ready to worship. And so uh, one of the ways to do that is to participate in the church calendar, and uh, coming up here on March 2nd is Ash Wednesday, and we're going to have an Ash Wednesday service right here at 6.30, and if you are going, Ash Wednesday, what is that? Isn't that just kind of a Catholic thing? No Protestant churches all over the world participate in Ash Wednesday, and Ash Wednesday first got became a thing, or the season of Lent, in the 4th century, way before um, uh, what, what is now known as the Catholic Church was uh, calling themselves the Catholic Church. And what the church calendar is, it's a uh, throughout the year, you have a diff different things that you do uh, to orient your heart more around uh, the, the story of our redemption or to engage in a unique way in the, some aspect of the story of our redemption. For example, Advent. Every year we celebrate Advent when we dive into and want to take a good focus on how the, the reality of how Christ came into our midst, that the light shone in our darkness. And what Ash Wednesday is all about is it's a way for us to uh, orient our hearts around the temptation and suffering of Christ. And so during on, on Ash Wednesday, what you do is you uh, sort of 
come and you, it involves some self-denial. A lot of times during the season of Lent, people will give up something. And all of that's designed to uh, help us to focus on our own mort mortality and the weight of our brokenness and sin. All, all of that, and then that goes right, that, the, the, the Lent, so Ash Wednesday starts, and there's 40 days leading up to Holy Week, and then you dive into things like Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, which we are going to be doing a Good Friday service, Palm Sunday starts off Holy Week. All of those things are designed to, again, get us ready to prime the pump so that when we get to Resurrection Sunday, we are ready to worship and celebrate this beautiful aspect of how Christ saved us. And so... Um, to that end, we're going to start with an Ash Wednesday service, as I already mentioned, 6.30 on March 2nd. I encourage you to come and be a part of that. Also, we have this family devotional during the, that you can use during the Lent season, available for a $10 suggested donation out there on the welcome desk. There's a QR code up here behind me that you can uh, access if you want to uh, do that right now where you're sitting, or you can put some money in the plate that's in the, or in the little basket right by the books, or you can um, give on the app or something like that. But I encourage you to grab that. Great way to spend some time in the 40 days leading up to Holy Week pondering uh, our, our, our sin and the, the reality of our sin. And so the more we re uh, are aware of the weight of our brokenness and sin, the more we are thankful for the fact that Christ set us free from that. Amen? Okay, so then also we have our new uh, book. It's book two. We're in the middle of our sin series, and um, this uh, is the book two. So I encourage you to grab that as the ushers were passing those around when you got in. If you're not there, you didn't grab one, they're right on the table back there. Great way to dive deeper into the passages we're looking at each week here. Well, without any further ado, I'd like to carry on with our series uh, by having uh, Dennis Fuquay come and share the word today. And the reason I, he's going to be preaching today is this. Um, what, when, we, when we put this nine-week series looking at sin, I knew that Romans 6 had to be a part of it. It's just a pivotal passage uh, just for any, uh, for, just for Christian living in general, but especially when we're considering uh, uh, how our relationship to sin. And Dennis, the first one-on-one -on -one meeting we ever had some you know, many, many moons ago, uh, he had shared with me how this passage had been such uh, an influential passage on his life. And so I asked him, hey, would you share how this passage has impacted you for almost 50 years? Uh, share some, I'd, I'd like the congregation to get some of that. So Put your hands together for one of our elders, Dennis Fuquay. Almost 50 years. <laughs> Who were you talking to? <laughs> Actually, I'll, I'll be right up front with you. Uh, the, the truth of this passage really became very vital to me in 1974. Fall of 1974, I remember it very, very well. Uh, I was reading a book by a guy by the name of Francis Schaeffer, and uh, he referenced the truth of Romans 6, and I knew that I didn't understand it like he understood it. And so I just dived in and read it over and over again. I, I'm going to guess, I, I knew I read it, read it scores of times. I'm going to guess I read it over 100 times over a, a couple-week period. And I remember just pondering it, pondering it, thinking about it, thinking about it. And then I remember the time when it clicked. And... Uh, so that was sort of the, the bit that Jeremy was referencing. I'll refer to that in a little bit. I, I really am honored to preach this morning here at Radiant Church. Um, I, I can say that any time, but specifically this message, because um, I, I pastored for 25 years. I've been involved in ministry for a long, long time, and, and I've preached many, many messages no message that I have ever preached is any more important than the message that I'm going to preach here for believers in Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm convinced it's the most important. Next to, next to getting into the family of God, next to acknowledging Jesus as our Lord and Savior, next to confessing our sins and becoming a believer, a follower of Jesus, this is the most important message that, that we can grab hold of. I'm delighted that we're doing this series on sin. I've never been involved in a church that did a series on sin. Nine weeks on sin. You must be really sinful people. To, <laughs> or at least by the end of nine weeks, you'll be really sinful, one or the other. So um, I'm, I'm grateful for this. But 
The reason why I'm grateful that we're focusing on this is because I hate sin. I hate sin. Every war that's ever been fought is because of sin. Every death that is, of any person who's died is because of sin. Every broken relationship, every harsh word that damages the hearts is because of sin. What is the problem with the world? Sin is the problem with the world. I hate sin. I'm delighted we're looking at this, not simply so that we can understand it, but so that also we can overcome it. And this truth that I'll share this morning is the way that we can overcome it. I've called this, what is our current relationship with sin? Before we were followers of Christ, we had a relationship with sin. Now that we're followers of Christ, we have a different relationship with sin. And there's coming a time, get ready to shout hallelujah here, I'm just prepping you. There's coming a time when we won't have to deal with sin. That was adequate. (laughs) But what is our current relationship with sin? I mentioned that every problem that the world faces, that we face in the world today, is because of sin. And the message I get to share with you this morning, dealing with our current relationship with sin, will help the world become a better place. Because it will help us understand how we don't have to be engaged in sin. The, 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 mess, the passage that we're dealing with is Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Uh, please just take a moment and memorize that, and I'll be back with you. <laughs> there was a time when, and I, when I was pastoring up in Gig Harbor that I encouraged weeks before our uh, Easter Sunday service, I encouraged the whole congregation to memorize Romans 6, all, the whole, all, 1 through I think it's 23 or 24, uh, all the verses of Romans 6. And then we, together we said it on Easter Sunday morning. It was a powerful time. Probably, I'm going to guess maybe 50%. A lot of people uh, actually memorized it during that time. I want to read it through. Please stand, which is our tradition here, to honor the word of God. I want to read it through. It's on the screen or it's on your screen or on your pages, however you want to do that. <clears throat> Father, I want to ask, would you help us grasp the truth that you've put in this chapter in such a way that we will recognize what our current relationship to sin is and what it isn't so that we can live more in line with the desires that you have for us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Romans 6, 1 through 14. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. That is a very hard term in the Greek language. Absolutely. No way. Don't even consider it. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead... By the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, that we would be that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. 
Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who've been brought, uh, brought from the dead to life. And, the members of your, and, the, and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Amen. Be seated, please. So there are three big themes in this passage. I'm going to show them to you. I'm going to put on the screen, I'm going to put all 14 verses, and I'll highlight these, big, these three themes. The first one is sin. I think it's 11 times or something like that, 11 or 12 times, sin is mentioned here. So this is a passage that deals with sin. The second theme is the theme of death or die or died or dead or crucified over and over again. I think this is 17 times that this word is used or that idea is communicated in these 14 verses. And the last idea is life, alive, resurrected. So these three ideas, sin, death, life, are wrapped up in this passage of Romans chapter 6. What I want to do now is I want to go back and look at these passages, these verses uh, again, and I'll just make some comments along the way so that we can get a fuller understanding of them. If we get this truth, we'll live fulfilled Christian lives. If we don't get this truth, we'll live a frustrated Christian life. This is the line of demarcation. This is the line that on this side of this truth, if you embrace this truth, if you get this truth, and if this truth gets you, you'll live a fulfilled life in Christ. On the other side, you'll live a life of frustration. Romans chapter 6. First of all, we need to look at the book of Romans in general. The book of Romans is pretty important. Amen? <laughs> any, any disagreement with it? The, like, the, book of, the book of Romans is like the Mount Everest of the New Testament. It is the, it is the high point of Paul's writings. And in the first three chapters of Romans, he lays out the fact that we are all sinful. Uh, culminating in the uh, verse that's well known, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then in Romans chapter 4 and 5, he introduces the idea, and specifically in chapter 5, he introduces the idea of how grace interacts with sin. And he says, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. So how can we get more grace? Well, let's sin more so that we'll get more grace. Well, that's where Paul is in his thinking, and that's where he's leading the people, the readers, in his thinking when he gets to Romans chapter 6. Well, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? If you look real carefully, you see a gasp in there. <gasps> no, 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 that's not, that's not what I'm saying. So what is the relation, what is our current relationship with sin? Number one, we're not to continue in sin. It's a bizarre idea that we as followers of Christ should continue in sin. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? What's our current relationship to sin? We died to sin. Don't you know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Don't, don't you know that? Don't you get it? Don't you understand that when you were identified with Christ in baptism, you were identified with his death. Verse 4. We were buried with him by baptism into death for a reason. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. That's where I get the idea, this phrase, newness of life. That's where I get the idea that this is the line of demarcation. On this side, it's newness of life. On this side, it's old life still. We get to walk in a new relationship in regards to sin. 
Verse 5. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, you have been united with him in his death. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Because you have been united with him in his death, you also are united with him in his resurrection. Not just your future resurrection, but in his past resurrection. I don't understand how it works. I just know that it works. I just know that it's true. Verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him. Do we? Do we know that our old self was crucified with him? We, we know that our old self was crucified with him for a reason. In order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. In order that sin would have no impact upon your life. Verse 7. For one who has died has been set free from sin. That's the truth. If you've died, you don't have to sin anymore. Verse 8. Now, if we have died, or since we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Do you see the repeated theme over and over again? We died, we live. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Remember that word, dominion. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. What is our current relationship with sin? We died to sin. We, were ra- we died when, when Christ died. We, we died with him there. So this idea of us dying when Jesus died, of us entering into his crucifixion and entering into his resurrection, is not only laid out here in Romans 6. This is the most full treatment of it that Paul writes, but there are other places, several other places in the New Testament, verses that you'll recognize. For example, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives. And by the way, Paul is not groaning this fact. He's not groaning about the fact, oh, I've been crucified with Christ. He's, no, this is, he's rejoicing. He's celebrating his funeral. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Galatians 2.20, also Colossians 2.20, as well as Colossians 3.1. Since you died with Christ, since then you've been raised with Christ. So these are all little summary statements of the same truth. And in a sense, you know, there's an asterisk that Paul puts there and he says, see Romans chapter 6. Okay? That's what he's in, in essence referencing. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 11, the saying is trustworthy for if we died with him, We will also live with him. So Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 10 can be summarized very, very briefly. And this was the aha that came to me years ago as I was reading this over and over and over again. This, this, the wonderful, huge, powerful, significant truth of Romans 6, 1 through 10 can be summarized in just 10 words. Here are the first five. When he died, we died. When he rose, we rose. Say that with me. When he died, we died. When he rose, we rose. Now say it with emphasis. (laughs) When he died, we died. When he rose, we rose. Or making it more personal, we can say it this way. When he died... I died. And when he rose, I rose. This is, the, this is the truth that will make all the difference in a believer's life. When we understand this truth, when we embrace this truth, we live in newness of life. If we don't understand, if we don't embrace this truth, we live in the old life. But... Understanding this truth, understanding the truth of Romans 6, 1 through 10, will have no impact upon us unless we do what Romans 6, 11 says. 
So, you must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's the ESV. The New uh, International Version says this. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God. The word so in the ESV or the word in the same way as, that, that's, that's saying at, in conclusion to or building upon what I just told you in verses 1 through 10, when he died, we died. When he rose, we rose. Now, understanding that, now here's what you must do. Consider yourself dead. Count yourselves dead. The word count in the NIV, it's an interesting translation because this is an accounting word. It means put this number in this column. Okay? Consider, consider, it, consider the debt paid. You owed $5.50, you paid $5.50, debt paid. It's an accounting term. So in the same way, consider yourself, put your, put your death in the death column. Okay. Now here's the interesting thing about verse 11. Again, the book of Romans is a huge, hugely important book. And Paul writes five and a half chapters before he tells us one thing to do. The first time he tells us to do something is in Romans 6, 11. I put it in red here. So you must consider yourself dead to sin and you must consider yourself alive to God in Christ Jesus. If we just simply nod at the truth of verses one through 10, but don't do verse 11, it will have no effect on us. The key thing is to consider ourselves dead to sin and consider ourselves alive to God in Christ. This is the first command that he gives. So uh, I encourage you, as you read scripture, uh, sort of remember that, that junior high um, uh, literature, not literature, uh, grammar, uh, grammar stuff. I was, trying, I was trying to say geographic stuff, but uh, remember that, G, uh, that junior high grammar stuff and, and make a note of the commands that we receive, that we're told. That will make a big difference in the way that we read scripture. And this is the first command. So Paul has said, okay, here it is. When he died, we died. When he rose, we rose. Therefore, act like it. Act like it. Consider yourself dead to sin. And this is the first command. And then he doesn't stop there. He gives us rapid fire other commands. He gives us those two commands in verse 11. And then in the next two verses, he gives us three or four more commands. Don't let sin reign. Now, this is the, this is the outworking. How do, you, how do you consider yourself dead to sin? Well, there's, there's, he gives us four specific other commands here. Don't let sin reign in your body. When sin comes and tempts you, when the evil one comes and says, this is the path of life, and you know it's not the path of life, it's a path of sin, it's just, just say no. Try it. Just say no. And you can say no because you are no longer alive to sin. You are dead to sin. Don't let sin reign in your bodies. Number two, or the, 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 number two, it's, uh, it's number four, but it sounds like number two because it's not the second one of these last four. The first one, don't let sin reign. Then the next one is this. Don't present the members of your body to sin. Don't say, okay, hand, it's okay if you steal this item. Don't say that. Don't present yourself to sin. Don't present your mind to to sin. Don't present your emotions to sin. So two negative things. Don't let sin reign and don't present yourselves to sin. The next two are, are positive. The next one says, but instead of presenting yourself to sin, present yourselves to God as those who are alive. You get to be a present to God. You get to present yourself. You get to present yourself. You get to wrap yourself up 
and present yourself to God and say, God, here I am. Here is all of me. Here's my mind, my will, my body, my emotions. Here's everything. I present it to you as one who is alive to you and to your ways. And then the final command in this one is this. I've added it here. Present yourselves to God as those who've been brought forth or brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. So you get to present yourself as one who's alive and then you get to present yourself, the members of your body, all the aspects of who you are, you get to present yourself to righteousness rather than unrighteousness. And you might say, well, Dennis, that's, that's nice, but that's not my experience. Well, then change your experience. Let it become your experience. Do what it says. Consider yourself dead to sin. Consider yourself alive to God. Let me give you an illustration, a couple of illustrations. <clears throat> let's just say, this is made up, let's just say Bill and Mary had a long, good marriage relationship. They had certain patterns in their relationship, and one of the patterns was that Bill would get up early, and he'd go and shower, and he'd go on downstairs and go get the newspaper, and he'd read the newspaper, and as he's reading the newspaper, Mary would come down and prepare him oatmeal and muffins, and he loved it. Every morning, that's what would happen. One morning, Bill got up early, he comes on down, he gets the newspaper, he reads the newspaper, and uh, he's finished with the newspaper, he goes on into the dining room, and there's no oatmeal and no muffin there. Bill says, what's this? This isn't the way it's supposed to be. There's supposed to be an oatmeal and muffin right here. So he goes upstairs. Again, sounds morbid, but follow me here. And he finds that Mary is dead in the bed. And he says, this is all made up. He says, Mary, where's my oatmeal? Where's my muffin? I want my oatmeal and muffin. Get up out of that bed and go down and get me that oatmeal and that muffin. And Mary just lays there because she's dead. She is not going to do what he says. In the same way, when sin comes to us and says, why don't you lie about this? You can be Mary. You can just lay there and not respond because you are dead to sin and alive to God. Now, the issue is this, that dying is not pleasant. Have you noticed? Years ago, well, for, I, I grew up in, in, in Gig Harbor, Washington, and, and it was this fairly small town, and there was only one dentist in town, and he was my dentist as a child as well as an adult, and one day as an adult, I... I was away, I was traveling away from Gig Harbor, and my tooth started to hurt terribly. And it was, for about two or three days, it was just very, very painful. When I got back, first thing I did is I went and saw Dr. Waller, and I said, Dr. Waller, I've got this, I had this terrible pain. It's sort of gone now, but I had this terrible pain here. And he looked at me and did a little examination. He said, yeah, uh, we need to do a root canal on that tooth. Yeah, ouch, ouch. So and I, I just heard about root canals. I'd never experienced one, glory. Uh, but I, I literally asked him, I said, well, do you, do you have to go to the hospital for this or, or what? He said, no, just come on into the office. And so I went on into the office expecting the worst. And, and he opened, you know, opened my mouth. He got his hands in my mouth. He did things. You know. and, and, I, and I'm saying, well, are you going to give me a shot to numb the pain or something? He said, oh, no, we're halfway through the root canal. And I said, pardon me? And he said, oh, yeah, the tooth already died, and so there's no pain happening now. You see, Dr. Waller taught me a wonderful spiritual truth there. Being dead doesn't hurt. Dying hurts, but being dead doesn't hurt. So when you're struggling with sin, when you're struggling to obey God, that, that, that pain that you're experiencing is because you haven't considered yourself dead to sin. When we consider ourselves dead to sin, then there's no more pain in the process. Well, how in the world do we get this lived out in very practical ways? I want to come back to Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life I now live, 
In the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you see the two key words there? Do you see the two absolutely key words that activates this? Now you do. By faith. By faith. It's, we, we activate this truth in the same way that we activated truth for the initial response of the gospel. When we by faith say, okay, Jesus says that I need salvation. I need my sins forgiven. And I say, okay, that's true. I agree with you. That's faith. And then he says, my death on the cross is sufficient for your forgiveness. And we say, yes, that's true. That's by faith. In the same way, we activate this truth by faith. He says, when you died, or when, when Christ died, you died. When Christ rose, you rose. And we say, yes, that's true. Let me give you another illustration of faith. Jeremy, would you help me, please? It's always fun when you can boss the pastor around. It's a fun thing. <laughs> I've asked Jeremy to help me here. And it's important that you not be able to see Jeremy. So he's going to sort of hide over here. Jeremy, are you actually there? Okay, there's Jeremy's hand right there, okay. Now, Jeremy, would you hold up any number of fingers on your hand? Okay, okay. How many fingers is he holding up? It's, you're just guessing now, okay? Okay, uh, okay. He's holding up seven fingers. Five on one hand, two on the other, okay? How many fingers is Jeremy holding up? Seven, you said seven. Why, do you know that? Do you know that to be true? Pardon me? Do, do, just yes or no. Do you know that to be true? Yes. Whoever said no, I, that's fine. But the reason why you said no is because you didn't believe me, what I said. Okay? Yep. Seven fingers. Yep. Okay. He's holding up seven fingers. How many fingers is he holding up? Seven. Okay. That's <laughs> Good job. <laughs> So the reason, if you know that, you know that not because you saw it, but because you heard it. If you know Romans 6 is true, you know it not because you're seeing it, but because you've heard it. The one who knows more than you has said it, and you can believe it. Therefore, you can know it, okay? Jeremy, one other time, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down, okay? Did Jeremy give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Now, this time, it's 50%. You can, you, you know, just guess, okay? Up, up. Yeah, you're right. Okay, he gave me a thumbs up, okay? Did Jeremy give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Uh, thumbs up. How do you, do you know that? Okay? If you know it, you know it not because you saw it, but because you heard it. Faith comes by hearing, okay? So if you know the truth of Romans 6, it's not because you see it, it's because you've heard it. The key thing is to then, if you know that you died to sin, alive to Christ, then the key thing is to consider it to be true and act like it. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay. Good job, yeah. Last night they gave him applause at this point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so a, a couple other brief things here. I, I referenced some some. Uh, ways that it's impacted me, but very specifically, I, one of the first ways that I noticed that this, that, that this impacted me is, is I noticed that um, I noticed I didn't have to be angry. There were times, uh, especially my teenage years, I was pretty angry quite a bit of the time, and um, and I, I and that went into our marriage relationship as well. And so, if Marilyn didn't do something the way I thought she should do it, I would first kindly, you know, address it. But if it didn't work out the way I wanted it then, there was this anger thing that would happen in me. I'm sure I'm the only husband that's ever experienced that. Uh, there was this anger thing that would happen in me. And, and when, I, when I grabbed hold of Romans 6, one of the first things that I, uh, would I, uh, the way that I applied it was I thought, you know what? I'm dead to anger. When I'd face a situation that would normally get me angry, I would say, wait a minute, hold on. I don't have to respond in anger. I am dead to that sin of anger. If I, if I would be tempted to lie, I could say, wait a minute, I don't have to lie. I'm dead to lying, and I'm alive to truth. 
Amen? Now, as it works out, this is the third Sunday of the month, and we get to share in communion together. I want to just ask you right now, would you just come up and get, get the elements here? We have both regular and, and gluten-free, uh, unleaded. <clears throat> and uh, so just come on up and, and uh, maybe get some to distribute to your row or to your family, however you want to do that, please. Okay? And I want to tie this in. It ties in, and I want to just show how it ties in to this wonderful truth of Romans 6 that we've been, that we've been talking about. And when you go back, please get in, in little groups. Get in groups of about three or four, something like that. One couple with another couple, an uh, individual with a couple other individuals, however you want to do that, okay? Just get together in, in a smaller group of three or four. And again, the truth is when he died, we died. When he rose, we rose. And we get to, by faith, activate that and live that, okay? Please stand and get in those groups, please, okay? <clears throat> and here's what, I, here's what I want to invite you to do. Go ahead and take that bread, <clears throat> peel off the, the tab so that you have access to the bread, and take that piece of bread. And I just want to, I want to lead us in a prayer together. I'll say a phrase, you say it after me. I think it will reflect your heart. It will sort of summarize what I've been sharing here this morning. So uh, pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, as I look at this bread, I recognize that you died. And I also recognize from Romans 6 that when you died, I died. You died for my sin. I died to sin. So I receive this recognizing that I died when you died. Receive it, please. 